Hello everyone and welcome to unit reviews of Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. We're going to go over all the units in part two of this game. Now in one straight away fashion of either one or even two videos, I don't know yet. Of course I'm Mecha and I'm joined here as always by Fellow Analyst. Fellow Analyst? Fellow Analyst. Original Raisins. Hello, how's it going? Hello, I'm I'm the Fenno expert here apparently. <laughs> As you say, but is Fenno a word? No, Fenno. Uh, there's like, like it so. Be. There, there's like a phenotype, which is uh, oh, there's like a phenomenon. So I think oh. Pheno is like a word root, mm -hmm. maybe. But yeah. I guess. Well, I just hope it's not it's too like, unflattering. Just because I'm yeah, a no. I guess like I would I would be an expert in things appearing like this menu right here. Uh huh. So, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen this menu many times, Raisin. So I'm sure you're an expert on it. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the preps menu. I did one of my uh -huh. stream chat, can tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. you, you do. Preps are half the battle. Turn zero is the most important turn. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, we're going over these units first that you see on screen. I think we're going to try to do it in order of them joining. Hopefully, we'll remember Lucia exists because she's not on here. She, she's gone off somewhere. And we also have the Crimean Royal Knights to take a look um, at. We're just going to go through one by one. Uh, for those of you that miss, who missed it last time, I usually do these unit reviews in my Let's Plays themselves, but I decided it'd be fun to try out to do them all in separate episodes, and that way people who really like unit analysis can watch them all there, all in one go. So we'll start with Lincia, because she's the first person you see in part two, uh, where you're doing a little sky battle. Of course, this is my one endgame save, so units are a little bit different than they would be from base, but in Lizia's case, she's still at base level, right? She's still a tier one unit, or tier three unit at level one, uh, just that she's closer to leveling up, I guess, and that's about it. And I can't think of many units that are like Alincia that are so different in... Th she basically has three joining times at once, and she's very different in all of them. When she's in one prologue, or when three pro... two prologue, that's the one, there we go, I got it third try. When you see her in 2 Prologue, she only has the Slim Sword and the Men's Staff. So all she can really do is heal and tickle enemies. <laughs> and that's yeah. about it. And she can, like, if she procs a stun, because she's a tier 3 unit, so she has the, the option of sometimes uh, getting a triple damage increase. Basically a crit, an extra crit chance. But if she doesn't get that, she's barely doing any damage to the enemies there, which are all Wyvern Riders. So offensively, she's terrible, but she can heal people when that alone is pretty valuable. So... I think of Valencia in 2 Prologue as just someone who's just self-improving and just trying to get some new experience for herself and keeping other people alive. And they can usually can do it on their own, but it's nice if they can free up a turn to do some attacking instead. Or, you know, using, using a blue stone or something else like that. So, she has some value there, but generally in 2 Prologue there's not too much going on either way. So it's kind of a small portion of her overall credit. And 2E, you get a completely different character. It's I guess it matches her, her character growth in the story as well, where suddenly she whips out the Amidi and just starts one running everything left and right. She gets like no XP for it, but it's so valuable. And because you also have Leanne and Alincia can move again after attacking thanks to Kanto, you can put her in positions over and over to just attack twice a turn or attack once and heal once. And she... I I think Har is still better because he has more bulk and he has less things to be wary of. But Alincia comes close just because she, in addition to the good combat, she also has healing. So I think she's super super powerful there and one of my favorite units to use in the whole series and then she leaves again and comes back in part four and at that point she's more of an s like character where she yeah she's still tier three but her stats don't really hold up that well against the enemies like she's she still has the amidi which is you know infinite use brave sword like how can you possibly go wrong with this amount of might right but she's still not two shotting things so she needs to use some bexp or she needs uh, just plain old Paragon and some leveling up and some kill feeding and maybe some physic healing to get levels. And when she does, she'll get a bunch of levels and she has really good growths. I think it's like between 40 and 60 for every stat that's relevant. And then she becomes really good again. And then if you want to take her into end game, she's pretty good there because she still has a staff utility, but she also has combat and a personal weapon that works really well. So it's, it's a very intriguing unit, I think. One that's very fun to use and a fun continuation of how she is in Path of Radiance. So... Yeah, I enjoy Lincia. I think she's very, very powerful, and I love that she has basically three different joining times where she's vastly different every time. What about you? Yeah, I, I definitely think I, I agree with you in that she's probably one of the most unique characters in this game, maybe the most unique, and it's not just because, you know, of the moving with the swords and the stabs, which, like, I guess one other unit has, like, a mount and a sword and a staff, but, like, come on, it's not even close. <laughs> like, M M Mist is nowhere near as good as this unit. So there are a couple funny tricks you can do with Alencia. Uh for one you know you mentioned she can 
she has the slim sword and the stabs and 2p so she can heal and she can tickle enemies and i was about to say and she can use the slim sword because i think the men's staff and the slim sword have like basically the exact same might so if you just have the men's staff out all the time then you're still like doing the same damage on the counter i don't really know exactly how much might the men has but it's kind of funny also you have a higher crit rate uh one kind of weird quirk about alencia is and this is kind of a weird sentence incoming so brace yourself is actually how fast she gains EXP as a result of being a staff user. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you gain the same amount of staff XP no matter whether you're tier 1, tier 2, or tier 3. And, like, there, there's a difference when you have tier 1 Lara, and it's like, oh my god, she's only gaining 11 EXP. But then you get, like, tier 3 Alicia, it's like, holy crap, I get a whole 12 when I use this mend. Like, it's kind of a lot. It's I think I've leveled her up on really? chapter. Yeah, all the time. She oh, always nice. gets 12 with the mend. Yeah. Uh, I think always gets 20 with the physic. So you can actually get her like a lot of levels in part two, even just by doing that, right? Like it's not, she's not total Jagan with no growths whatsoever. Uh, however, speaking of bases and growths, I will say that her stats do have a lot of catching up to do. Like if I'm going to be honest, Mecca, these bases are kind of atrocious. They are for a tier like, three level one unit. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. For, well, not even for a tier three level one unit. It's, I, I remember I think I quizzed someone. I like showed her stats and I showed Oscar's stats right next to each other. And I was like, which two units are these? And they guessed like, I think they guessed like Marsha and someone else. And I was like, nah, this is, one of these is a Lincia. Like one of these is a free promote, <laughs> which is, which is kind of weird. Cause like, I always viewed her as this really strong unit who never falls off. I very frequently bring her to end game and whatnot, just because of the staff utility. Uh, but it's kind of weird how her bases and her, and her combat can kind of be like this poor, but she still has so much utility just by virtue of being flying and having stabs and casting the rescue. Like, I'm pretty sure Lincia is responsible for like 75% of all rescue stabs cast in Radiant Dawn history ever. Mm -hmm, probably. Right? <laughs> like, she she's just really good. And to be honest, on any map where it's optional to deploy her, you're probably not doing the wrong thing by deploying her. Uh, but also just like... That's just game, user right? Yeah, basically just end game. Oh, well, that's a weird way to put it, but yeah, no, you're right. Um, <laughs> just but, checking. Yeah, no, it's there, there's just so many different things you can do with her. F feel free to get creative. Feel free to you know pick up every staff you can. Uh, I think the only thing you don't want to get creative with is the swords. Like Omni is just so much better than all of your other options. It's crazy. So just use Omni. Yeah, there might be like one or two spots where you want the ranged sword instead because you absolutely need range. But almost all the time, even this one range is going to be better than having scuffed two range with a wind edge or something. I, I did yeah, this pull one. up uh, Oscar and Lincia stats both, and they are embarrassingly similar. You're absolutely right. The only edge that Lincia really has is res, which is not as relevant as everything else. Oscar's even better in some stats. So, yikes. Yeah, you're right. He, she is under power. But her growths are substantially so much better that if they did join at the same time, I think there'd still be an argument for Lincia to stat wise. Oh, yeah. And, and the stun matters, right? I mean, yeah, that exists. So, yeah, I, I think it's have it. skill divided by two proc rate, right? And then the meaty hits four times. So it's a pretty good proc rate overall. That's right. Oh, I should remember. Don't forget to remove mercy. Um, yeah, in part four, I saw a poor soul. You remember? Um, uh, shit, I forgot his name. I always forget people's names in this kind of thing. He uh, the guy we did draft races with sometimes. Uh, uh, but not Castle, recently. Justin Gina Wolfstrike. Uh, Cena. We'll, we'll come up with it know. at some point. I'll, I'll, I'll we'll remember it. Um, he <laughs> he went into part four preps, giving Alencia a paragon before forgetting to take off Mercy. So oh, <laughs> she was God. locked out of like getting kill XP. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's too much Mercy. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Really funny they gave her that skill. I guess they gave it to you that way so you can give it to someone else so you can set up kills for Alencia. I guess that was the idea. Or setting up for Peleus, one of those things, I guess right? So. Well, she, like, wanted to not fight, right? So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. a funny skill, I guess. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about we move on to... Let's see. Well, normally it'd be Marsha, right? Because she's also around. But we can save her for Crimean and Royal Knights. Um, so I guess... Ebony uh, Brown. Come again? How, how about... Let's just go down the list this way, right? I... I Actually, no. Brom, Brom Nephany. Yeah, we that'd be kind of about, how about How about Liana and Luchi? Because they're in that chapter, and then we go from there. Okay, I, I agree. Let's do let's do recruitment order. Yeah, sure. So, well, I can do that. I'm embarrassing. Um, Niluchi is kind of a comedic character in a sense that if you want to do anything with him, you kind of have to resort to funny strats. Otherwise, he's just kind of a pre-promote kind of Lagoos in part two. Pretty good one at that, at that though, because, you know, he does fly. And his speed is massive. It, his his unpromoted stats don't really do him justice, but imagine most of them are doubled 
then you have a unit with 20 strength and 36 speed. 36 speed sounds really absurd when you're like, imagine you're playing FE7 and someone talks about, and you've never seen anything else outside of GBA, and then someone mentions, yeah, there's a Raven Laguz in FE10. He has 36 speed at base and he's not even really that good. Just laugh your ass off. Like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Um, uh, so he does double everything, he does dodge almost everything, but he's only around for part two effectively. Like, he doesn't rejoin until part four, which is really where the main issue lot was. I think if he rejoins somewhere in part three, I think he'd still have to deal with a lot of other issues he has, like the gauge and the strength we're going to get into. Uh, but that's a big part of why he's not considered very good. It's just, he's never around. He's more of a temp unit. Uh, but at being a temp unit is pretty good because he can weaken enemies, sometimes he can one-on enemies despite the low strength. And the gauge is annoying. I I usually run out of like Livy Grass and I'm pretty stingy with my Lagu Stones because I want to save some for part 3. And as a result, I tend to underuse people like Nelucci and Leith and Mordecai a little bit. I think this playthrough, I ended up using this Lagoose stone you see right here, and I just almost ran out of like Lagoose stuff in part two, because you do have quite a bit, but you also have like three Lagoose to maintain. And if you can deal with the Lagoose gauge issues, then you do have a pretty good like temp unit in Luchi, because he can fly around, he can canto, which once again is great synergy with Lian, uh, but it also just allows you a lot more flexibility in general, even if Lian wasn't there. And, I mean, we could complain about low defenses, but in the end, this guy dodges so much and has so much HP that it doesn't matter that his defense is looking a little low. He even transformed, like, 20 defense and 20 res is perfectly fine when he's mostly facing tier 1 and sometimes low tier 2 enemies, so he's perfectly fine. If you want him to be good long term, uh, you should work on his strike rank as much as you can. I think Razes knows a lot more about that than I do, uh, but the general gist is whenever you can attack with Nelucci, be transformed or untransformed, um, have him have a go, uh, hopefully double attack, and get that A rank strike to S rank, and he can do for some great stuff. Uh, especially because he also has Wrath at base, which is not a very desired skill, and you can't even take it off in part 2. So if you can get into low HP, you get some funny crits that way. I think there's ways to kill the final boss of part 2 with him, which I find very amusing. So uh, yeah, it's either a funny temp unit or it's a funny long-term unit, but then you have to do some pretty funny stuff, right? Yeah, and I mean, so some of the funny stuff you can do is, as you mentioned, building the strike rank. It is totally possible to get him to S rank strike, or S rank strike in his joining map. Uh, it involves a lot of untransformed combat on clouds, and if you're iron bending, there, there's actually a decent chance he just dies. <laughs> to be honest, so like Oops. you didn't e e even if you're very careful and cautious, there's a chance that he actually just gets like blown out by some unlucky hits, right? So it can happen, but I mean, then you have S Strike Naoluchi with a 12 might weapon, so you have 32 attack, 36 AS for basically the rest of the game, right? So mm -hmm. I will mention the 36 AS. I, I don't really think it's anything to sneeze at. Like, yeah, his attack is kind of low, but I mean, if you get the S rank strike, then you're doubling basically everything like forever. Yeah. Because <laughs> is there's... 36 like the exec benchmark? You need to double everything in endgame that you need to. Uh, I, to be honest, I think so. There's <laughs> I, maybe a, some nerd is going to find a random sword master in the desert with like 33 AS. And it's like, OK, dude, fine. Mm -hmm. But, like, come on, just don't have them fight that guy, right? I bet he still so, doubles all sort of masters. I doubt they surpass 32, but maybe I'm wrong. I was thinking of, like, yeah. auras and spirits and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's 39. I guess, well, 36 when you have the white pool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess with white pool, yeah, fine. Uh, one kind of weird thing about the beak is it actually does have kind of low might. And I know you're like, oh, it's only one might less than the, what's it called, the Talon for the Hawks or whatever, which is, like, the next most comparable unit. I mean that like that's that still adds up if you're doubling everything, yeah, right? So I agree. like it, it his strength is already low and then his weapon is also like lower might. It doesn't it doesn't really help that much. So uh, definitely go ahead and you know, if you want to use Nailuchi train up his strike rank, another very important thing is to have him like rescue Leanne or shove around Leanne a bit. Because if you can very quickly build the support for the plus one might on the attack, I mean again that just helps out a lot. So he has a very fast building support with Leanne. You can just build that up, get the plus one attack. It's very nice. Oh, and eight wrath too. That's kind of funny. But... Mm -hmm. I've never seen a. I don't think we've seen a proc that's played through at all. Because for him to get low, he has to like get hit by some kind of bow. Basically, yeah, it's like that's it. There's just, he's never he's never getting low. Yeah, maybe I guess Lutf can get him there. Yeah, I guess. And like, if he is getting low, it's probably against an enemy. Oh, mm -hmm. I guess like actually, you know what? Here's the thing about getting him low. Is, yeah, and just uh, remember that. Well, actually, remember that bow gun in two two actually brings him down to exactly one HP, so as long as he <laughs> okay. dodges everything else. <laughs> okay, so just don't get hit Lamao by everything else. Yeah, I'll get hit by that and nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> then you can triple your damage. There you go. Uh, sounds like a battle save strat if I ever saw one. 
Oh, yeah. Only the most reliable strats are allowed through the door. He's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like Untransformed would be an easier way to do it. Get him low. Mm -hmm. That's just pretty good idea, dude. dude man. That, that's a better idea than mine. So. Yeah, it's also free gauge, I guess. Alright, um, I guess might as well go over Leanne then as well. It's not going to be super complicated because we went over Raphael in part one and Leanne is in a lot of ways similar. Uh, I do think Leanne is more useful in part two than Raphael is for part one. That's like debatable, right? But I find that Raphael is very hard to use beyond turns one and two in both of his maps that he's in in part one. But Leanne is in three maps and there's more units that are... Uh, easier to reposition thanks to Kanto with like Lincia and Har and Marcia and um, some other people too, like Niluchi especially. So it's easier for Leanne to find two targets and that sometimes it's for Raphael to find four. And then Leanne also just flies. Um, and then the fact that she only refreshes two is, you know, it's still good. It's still really, really powerful because it's going to be the two best units. Usually when you have transformation targets or uh, vigor targets, you're going to have like one or two, you really want to figure it in a couple that's like, yeah, that's nice, I guess I might as well include them because I have the space. Uh, but Leanne is always picking like the two best targets, at least in, in 2E. It's always going to be Ilincia and Har. I think for all the turns we played in 2E, almost every single one of them was with dancing for Har and Lincia, or sh it should have been that way. And then... Yeah. Uh, I think there's like one turn where we danced Mordecai, but... Or, no, there was one turn where we thought about dancing Mordecai, and then we danced Har and Alinsky anyway. I think so. <laughs> there was one turn where we danced Khalil, and then we didn't need to, because Har plus Khalil was enough to kill the Armor Knight with Nullify. Oh, true. I mean, <laughs> on that turn, we danced Khalil and Har, yeah. So. Yeah. And in that case, I mean, even if like someone like Khalil is better than Har in some instance of dancing, then Leanne can still do that, so... She's still as good as a dancer as can ever be. And yeah. her and transformation... I yeah, go ahead. As I said, let's make this clear. It sounds like we're kind of like mocking her for this. It's it, this is totally a positive. No, this is a pro. This is a pro. This is a pro. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's good. You're picking the right targets. That's good. Um, I was just gonna say her transformation doesn't really matter. Uh, when she transforms, she doesn't change the number of people she dances for. I think she might gain one move. Like whatever, cool. Uh, she's probably arguably the worst heroine to bring to end game because. I think you can find people who want, prefer Raisin over Raphael and vice versa, but it's pretty hard to find anyone who thinks Leanne is better than those. And you can only take one hero into the tower for balance reasons, probably, which I totally understand. Uh, if you could bring more, you might want to bring Leanne, but you probably uh, you probably can't, because you're probably playing the vanilla game. Um, yeah. But yeah, she's uh, she's good at what she does, but once the other heroes come into the picture, she's not going to be too real. I guess in part four, she's forced into a part where she's still useful. So like even before endgame, she still has some uses outside of part two. Uh, but yeah, here on good. There's not much else to see, I think. Yeah, I, I I kind of agree with your assessment that she's probably the weakest Terran because like uh, Raphael has that awesome four-person dance and Raisin. Ra Raisin's kind of funny. We'll talk to him in a bit, but he's he, he he's he's kind of special in ways that Leanne is just like not to be honest. Like I think Leanne gets the job done for the chapters where she shows up for all of part two. Like there's not really there's not even like more than two fantastic units for any of the maps where she's present in all of part two, right? It's like she's either dancing Har and Alincia, or she's dancing like Neoluchi and Lucia, or she's dancing Har and Alincia, right? So Yeah, I mean that's pretty good. I, 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 I like I do I think she she's better than Raphael in part one, personally. Don't you? Then that one? Uh like, what, Actually what? yeah, to be you know what, to be honest, I think you're right, because with the pacing of the maps, um, I, actually, it's really hard for me to say. I don't really feel, feel like I know enough about different strats in part one to like make a comment on whether or not they're better. It, it, it's hard for me to compare the two in my mind right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think of it in terms of, like if you think about what Raphael actually does in maps in one eight, uh, you might figure Nyla or Rofo look. But we went over that in part one. It's like how hard it is to do anything beyond maybe turn one. Maybe if yeah, you walk him over to one side, he can do a little bit more, and that's kind of it. It's going to be some turns where he just figures no one. Right. You know, and you then, got a point. Raphael only dances two people in one of those maps. Yeah, and then you got um, an endgame where I think it's turn one and maybe turn two contributions are huge. But after that, unless you're planning it out very elaborately, I find it super hard to get more utility out of Raphael outside of those first two turns. So mm -hmm. it's gonna. And then if you assume that both of those maps take like say six, seven turns, two of those have Raphael like dancing for four people, but Leanne dances for two people almost every turn in her three maps. That's right. So I will say uh, one other thing about Leanne, and this specifically about 2e. Actually, it's two other things about Leanne and 2e. Uh, the first one is make sure you do take advantage of her Kanto whenever mm -hmm. you can. Um, there were a lot of times when we had Leanne like on the middle platform, and we were like dancing and Kantoing back, making sure we were staying outside of the uh, range of longbowmen and whatnot. 
Uh, your other Heron didn't have Kanto, but this one does. And if you use Path of Radiance, then your Heron didn't have Kanto, but this one does. So just make sure you're used to it. Uh, also on 2E, fun fact, she can die. <laughs> and it totally doesn't matter. Uh, she just still shows back up again in 3-11. Oh, same wow. as before. Brand new. Just <laughs> as, as if she'd never left, basically. It's funny, because she's a uh, game over in chapters before. Yeah, she's a game over in... Uh, in 2p she did you, her you thing can, did she fulfill her role at that point yeah did she you can you can also kind of use her for funny capture baiting into in 2p but uh, honestly i think the the whole capture baiting with leanne is a total i i i don't i don't like the strategy i think you just lose too much action economy yeah because she loses her turn get right if you once. get her back yeah you lose the dance that turn it's like mm, yeah that's it, it just it just compounds like she gets captured and then you don't have enough action economy to keep her from getting captured a second time and then she gets it, it just gets out of control just don't let it happen yeah i agree it's uh that's an emergency thing i guess if you want to prevent someone from dying but just plan it's with dancers in general just the first thing you should be thinking about is how you're going to use your dancer especially yeah, exactly. uh, one note about the the canto one thing i often like uh stumble with or stumble over when i'm using leanne is canto is nice but she only has five moves so if you're moving her two spaces in one direction, that's like half of her movement, basically. So yeah, <laughs> if you use three, if you use three tiles, especially with those clouds in the way or ledges, it's really easy to get caught in a spot with Leanne where she can't go anywhere safe afterwards if you're not thinking about it. So yeah, you have to be very weary where she can go after dancing. Um, so that's the two prologue squad. I tried a Har, of course. I guess we should. Mm -hmm. I guess we should discuss Har. I guess we might as well, right? Because no, he's there. This is no. gonna be easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be easy. Uh, it's uh, I've I've had I've seen people argue. That horror is not the best unit in the game, but usually it's because of uh, some some rigged scenarios, some very meta discussions. But I've never seen anyone who says yeah, horror is bad in this game. It's it's impossible to find like trolls maybe some trolls. But generally, no one who played this game can come out of the impression with a negative with a negative impression of horror. It's just impossible in any facade as well, like as a character, as a unit, um, as as design, everything about it is just absolutely perfect. I've had a couple runs with Har, where I felt like he was underperforming because I didn't bother investing in his speed. Uh, this is the first playthrough I've done in a long time where I've actually used resources that are best used on a Har. I gave him the speed wing and I gave him the skill book. I think that's the case in these in the screenshot because you can see his skills capped. I think it's also after a couple good Vex levels, so it's a little bit inflated compared to his normal bases. Oh, it makes such a massive difference. It's the difference between Har uh, weakening everything for your other units, which can be very helpful, but it's it feels a little lacking because you know in your head, or at least I know in my head, this guy gets his one round, everything in sight, and just do it over and over and over again. And all he has to do is like get a healing turn off, like get a physic or swallow a vuln or whatever it is you do with those things, and just keep going and going. And as long as you keep him out of range of thunder mages, he's never gonna stop. It's so fulfilling. And sometimes that is just what I need. I just want a unit that just goes burr on the map with like eight to ten move and whatever you want. And this unit just does it all. He is both in part two and part three is absolutely dominant, and I completely love him for it and that's i think that's the reason why everyone puts him at the top of tier lists and favorites and why in, in terms of tilt kill counts he's usually in the top five it just it's really hard to get around hard you cannot use him you can ignore him if you want to he's not essential he just lightens the load on your on your on your mental health basically by using him yeah but it's just less <laughs> suffering if you use him uh it's hard to compete with good really good bulk and one to range uh and flights like it's such a splendid combination uh, but if you if you do want to raise units from zero to hero in part three, it can definitely be nice to have a heart that doesn't double everything. If you want to raise like I don't know Boyd or Soren or something, then it could be nice to use them to feed them instead. Uh, but if you want to clear maps in the most efficient way possible, if you want to just see enemies units melt as fast as possible, then Har is the fastest path, uh, the path of least resistance in in more ways than one. I I can't really put it any better than that. My my mental capacity is at its peak when it comes to describing Har. <laughs> but uh, damn, I love him though. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, frankly, like anytime someone like ever brings up like, oh, I think this unit might be the best unit in Radiant Dawn. It's like, okay, well, why are they better than Har? <laughs> right? Like it's, it, he, he's just the default, just total best unit. May, honestly, like might be best unit in the series, like relative to their own game. Right? Like might be. But yeah. Didn't you, uh, I, I don't know if you were going anywhere with this, but I do have that question again for you this time, direct from me to you. Would you rather mm -hmm. play this game without Har or without Soth in hard mode? Without, oh, I mean, I think I'd rather play without Soth to be honest. 
Like, I'm, here's the thing. I'm sure that, like, the moment I say this, someone's, like, loading up our old video yeah. to see if, like, I said the opposite thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, like... I think my answer after... was with I'd rather play without R, I think, for, for the record. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. I don't know if you had an answer. Yeah, I mean, I think, like... There, there are a couple chapters that are going to be rough in the Dawn Brigade, but, like, just just get through them. Right? Like, just, just get through them. And then you go into part... You go into part three, you go into part four. Like, he just so greatly trivializes all the maps and that like i i remember playing zero percent and i think har first fell off in like 4-3 or something that was the first time we hear like was actually having difficulty in combat on zero percent <laughs> and i'm like okay this this unit's kind of good so i do want to uh bring up a couple things though mm -hmm. so because i don't necessarily i don't necessarily think har is like completely idiot proof uh it's possible to have a bad har mm -hmm. it's possible to misuse him in a way and so i want to talk about like a couple things you can do to kind of ensure that he's doing a bit better uh one thing is early master crown pretty important first master crown you get is a couple chapters from now frankly it's like it's either horror or titania you'd really be a fool to pick a different option yeah if I'm being... I, it depends on what your goal is when playing the game right if you want the best option possible i absolutely agree um, okay, yeah. There's some units that are like really, really well improved with the crown, like Gatri and Soren. It's just they're not as good as those other options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, and to be fair, I'm straight. I'm speaking like from a purely like robotic, must yeah. be efficiency standpoint. Yes. Like if you have fun promoting someone else, then like please do it. Like enjoy your video game. Um, but early master count's good. Another one is 24 speed. 24 speed is what you need to double like most people in part three. So that's kind of why I was suggesting the speed wing, not only because it helps you double Ludvek, but also because it kind of ensures that with the promo that you're doubling everybody in part three that you need to double. Uh, I think 20, 26 speed is like another thing that you need for like late part three or early part four. But like by the look, by the looks things like we're playing with growths and we already got a plus speed on Har, so you're already getting it. The mm -hmm. skill book trick is kind of fun uh, because again, you cap his skill and now look at this, like he, he got like a strength speed defense level, which is basically the dream. You, you basically got a promotion, right? So. <laughs> I think his promotion is plus two in each of those to tier three, I think. Yeah, it's, it's plus two in each of those, but I mean, mm -hmm. are you are going to be upset with the strength speed defense level? Come on. Never, 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 never. No, I think, uh, Har is probably the best example in Radiant Dawn besides maybe Mia of a unit that improves a lot through the bonus XP mechanics. People sometimes bring up someone like Aaron or Aran, however you want to pronounce it, but I think Har is probably the best example. He's joined with his speed, his skill almost capped, and then he can get his strength and defense further up, which is just what you want. And if you get him far enough, you can get more speed out of it too. It's just so perfect for him. He can do it in tier 3 too, I believe. Just getting three stats on Bex is so good for him, but he, his class stats are so close to capping all the time. Exactly. And even something like strength, skill, defense isn't a tragedy, right? Like, I wouldn't be upset at that. Like, because it's strength and defense. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing I will say about Thunder Mages, that's kind of like his Kryptonite, is the Thunder Mage just critting him for a million damage. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really super duper concerned about that, like if, if, if it's causing you a lot of anxiety, uh, one thing you can just transfer Jeffrey's Brave Lance over to Marsha or over to this part of the army and just put it on horror and he's totally fine. Now you have a totally foolproof way to just kill every Thunder Mage you see, 100% reliable. And you know, then just deal with the rest of the enemies from there. So as long as you, as long as you do that, again, that that's like if you're really concerned about it. Uh, there are other options too, like just level a bunch of strength and use a tomahawk, for example. Uh, but if you're really concerned about, oh, maybe I won't level up strength, just use the brave lance. You've got it. Yeah, at a glance, Har is weak to Thunder Mages, but it takes a very specific formation for the game to be foolproof against Har, or to, for the game to be Har proof. Because, well, first of all, he can kill the Thunder Mage that you can, uh, like you said, with a Brave Weapon or something, and then they're just gone. If there's not multiple, then he doesn't care. Uh, I think the problem with Thunder Mages for Har is there are skills that negate his weakness. Uh, you can put Nullify on him to negate the triple damage or the triple might, I should say. Uh, but true. then he can still get crit, and I think he either still dies or comes close to it. Uh, you can also put Fortune on him if you still have that somehow. I think there's only one Fortune in the game, and it's on Meg, which I usually sell. But if you have it, then you could put it on him and prevent the crit, but then you still take massive damage from a normal Thunder Mage attack. So I usually prefer, instead of doing those, to put something like Pass or... Um, what's the other thing you can do? Celerity on him. And that way it makes yeah, him so sorry. flexible that he doesn't really care. And most of the time, Har will survive a Thunder Mage and kill him with a Hand Axe. This is what happens most of the time. So... Depending on what kind of playthrough you're doing, if you're doing normal mode, you can do, do these like battle saves to make sure he doesn't die that way, kind of like you're using the turn wheel from Shadows of Valencia. 
Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you can play that way, and it just it's not a delivering weakness. It's not like a crossbow for an outlier. It's like hard and weak to bows like those. That's a much more powerful weakness. Thunder mages are kind of yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'll, he, he, he has can deal to with get it in so many ways. So, and to be fair, there is like always eight to twelve percent crit or something from the thunder mage, but like you do have to get crit. So yeah. It's, it usually doesn't happen. Uh, I guess the last thing I have to say about Har that I almost forgot is he has an 8 cancel, which sometimes stops a counterattack, which is it's usually overkill. Like, he does it on the last hit a lot. <laughs> it's kind, yeah. of, kind of amusing. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a funny example of a skill you usually don't need it on anyone else. Like, I don't remember anyone else wanting this cancel. Maybe Mia or Nefti sometimes can use it, but I generally just leave it on the Har, and it does work every now and then. It's not a way you can kill a Thunder Mage without getting countered. That's true. I, I mean, can cancel is kind of funny. Like, there are a couple funny builds you can do with cancel, like adept cancel is fun, vantage cancel is fun. Uh, but aside from that, it's, it's it's hard for me to really think of a, a crazy use of this skill. It's just like I, I don't know, I'll just keep it on them because why would I? Why would I go into the skills when you take something off of fire, right? So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Usually, he won't have more skills than he has space for, so I, I do agree. There's no re no reason to. Okay, so we're done with the two prologue squad at last, and all four of them. All four of them, <laughs> but uh, you know, took a little bit. Uh, I guess, hey, besides Marsha, but she'll come up later, trust. Um, so, Nephany, I guess, and Brom. I, I've had some comments. We talked about Brom being the lord of the chapter that Nephany joins in. Uh, but mm -hmm. according to the menu somewhere, Nephany is the actual lord. So I guess that's still up for debate right now. According to the geeks in your comment section, all right, uh, fair stop enough. Stop insulting my comment section. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just, they're just <laughs> correcting us, technically. Well, they're, they're correct, but they're stopping my Brom propaganda, okay? <laughs> Shouldn't have gotten in the way of my brown again, brown again. Okay, for a I moment know. though, let's let's do Nephany prop again, right? So, I think Nephany has something in common with uh, with Edward from Part One, and that's she changes vastly depending on what difficulty you're playing on. I think if you're playing on hard mode, Nephany is a serviceable grow mercenary, uh, but she becomes grow mercenary later on. Then you can train for a bit in Part Two. Uh, one of the best targets for kill experience in general. She doesn't have the goose gauge and reduced the XP gain, so. It's a good idea to feed Nephany a little bit in part two if you're thinking about using her. And then in part three, she's just, uh, you know, she's just kind of there. And until she gets to tier three, she won't be standout, but she can have enough speed to double and enough power to get to that sweet spot where you're like doubling and three shots, th usually three shotting enemies. Maybe sometimes you're like one shotting a mage or something or like one round killing a mage. But that's about it. So you can put some like adept on her. And some of the time she'll kill something. She has the durability to survive like one or two enemies. So. She's okay. She's not Har, she's not Ike, but she's alright. She's serviceable. If you're playing on normal or easy mode, the amount of XP and bo especially bonus XP available to Nephany just skyrockets ridiculously. Like I said many times before, normal mode effectively gives you four times as much Bexp as it gives you um, in hard mode. So in part two, there's a bunch of bonus XP you get from Joffrey's Charge along with the other chapters, and you have no better targets for it than Nephany. Like, unless you really want to train Braum or you want to make Har better, I mean, I can blame you, but he doesn't need it, generally speaking. Uh, you have the option of making Nephany really, really good with that bonus XP if you want to, and no one else really cares about it, other than units that are either worse at using it or not as available. So you have the option of bringing Nephany to tier 3 if you want to, which I always find like a pretty amusing option. But even if you don't do that, if you just give her like a bunch of decks but not all of it, it still makes her much better coming into part 3, and it makes a big difference in her performance, I find. Um, she's another unit who's really good at capping stats individually and then getting her a little worse stats better off, like her skill and her speed, and I think even her res uh, are usually good enough to cap into your two somewhere. And then once you do that, um, you can generally reliably get strength and defense from her bonus XP, which are normally not her weak spots, but they're like shaky, but bonus XP makes them generally solid for late game. And then she's going to be just fine in part four, as long as she gets to tier three. Uh, I think Nephany is serviceable in part four. Um, so other than that, Innate Wrath is kind of funny. It's not super reliable or anything. Neither is the Steel Great Lance she joins with. That's kind of annoying, but you can get a bunch yeah. of better weapons. You can forge her a better Lance in part two, in part three, and she'll be just fine. So, hard mode, serviceable, um, normal mode, um, actually really fun to use and really, I wouldn't say great because, you know, she doesn't change much compared to other units, but for a unit fuel perspective and for like how easy it is to get her up to par, normal mode is much better for Nephany, but still nice for hard. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I do actually really like your comparison to Edward because I really think she's like the growth unit of part two mm -hmm. in a sense that so like like take a look at her stats, right? So she's got low to mid HP and then all of her other stats are like very middling, which means that basically any stat she gets on level just drastically improves her performance as a unit. 
right? Like she's her speed is just barely below doubling benchmarks for a lot of guys. So the moment she levels speed, she like doubles a third of the enemies now that she wasn't doubling before. And her defense and res are pretty high. So the moment she levels one of those, that actually does like boost her survivability by a fair amount. Same with any of this HP stuff. So honestly, if you're looking for a growth unit, you know, this Nephany who starts at level one, yeah, yes, yeah, she does start at level one, is honestly not a bad target for a lot of this stuff. And yeah, you could argue like, oh, well, maybe Mio would be better. Oh, maybe Gaetri would be better. Yeah, fair enough. But like at that point, like they have such a level lead that it's really hard for me to view them as like a growth unit the same way that Nephany is because she's joining at level one. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like I will say joining at level one is a bit of a weakness because it's hard to get her up to that promotion level. But if you're looking for a unit who's fun to, you know, use and level up and like cap all of her sets, like I think Nephany honestly is the easiest time capping literally all of her sets of probably any unit mm -hmm. in the right. game, right? Yeah. So. And let's see, I it no longer really thinking about her gross, just thinking purely about her utility in part two. Uh she she is a bit of a liability in some of the maps just because like she can actually crumble if she hasn't leveled up her defenses at all she, she can actually crumble to like a focus attack from a bunch of enemies if you leave her open it's pretty important to just like employ straight line strats for example in 2-2 that's the fog of war map where if you like leave her with two or three melee squares that can attack her it's pretty easy for him to just gang up on her and kill her uh, but that's pretty much the only bad thing that can happen to her is you just have too many attacking squares and then like three people attack her and she dies In every other map there's so many there's so many choke points or there's so few enemies that you can just kind of put her in the choke and two enemies will attack her max and she just lives everything so she's totally fine in that regard i'm hurt too uh the innate wrath is kind of funny but aside from that it's uh it, it's hard for me to say much more about this unit she's just kind of like a ball of stats later on if you put a bunch of xp into her mm -hmm. okay we can move on to your lord i think if you want to Good yes, old, uh, our lord. Good old Brom. Uh, Brom, I think, is mostly defined by his joining chapter. Kind of like Nephany, where there is like all you got besides Neph. And so he has to do a lot of work at that point. And then as more units join, he becomes less relevant. But he's still able to do like a couple of things that are helpful, generally involving choking points. But I just got to, like, early on when he's just, uh, like, when it's just him and Neph, I just really appreciate his massive bulk and reliability compared to Nephany, honestly. Because I feel like he's more accurate with his iron and steel axes than Neph is with the steel great lance. And then he just tanks hits over and over okay sometimes he has to like has to heal because he's taking every hit ever but he's still yeah. most of the time he's doing most of the damage he's doing most of the work there basically he's just all reliable in that chapter basically uh and then after that you get ter you get like a bunch of lagoos that are basically him but better with like twice as much move like naluchi and um uh mordecai especially bear some similarities um because they're just so durable as well uh but able to move further and do more damage at that point it makes more sense to use them as your main damage dealers but Brom is still able to contribute a little bit, and then we get him back in part 3. He has the same availability as Nephany, but I know a lot more people that like using Nephany and like using Brom. It probably just has to do with the fact that he has less... Well, less movement is usually not much of a problem for these types of players, but maybe just less flashiness about them, less animations. Maybe the fact that he's a dude instead of a, a woman is the reason mm -hmm. why. I don't know, I think Brom is just as much mean potential as Nephany, but he usually gets sorted in the stick. Uh, he's, he's he's really slow. He has a lot of trouble getting to doubling treasure. I don't think he even ever gets there without massive favoritism. Whereas Nephany, like you said, she's a ball of stats when she gets going. So that's probably one of the reasons why. It's harder to get him to actually one-shot a bunch of enemies. Uh, but he's in a pretty reasonable class for dealing damage. Like the Axis is like the best weapon type in Radiant Dawn, so he still has some options there. Uh, Disarm is kind of funny. Uh, I, it's really hard to utilize, but if you have Heather there nearby when he disarms an enemy, she could steal her weapon if her strength is high enough. I think she has to have more strength than the weapon has weight. And then if they're if it's unequipped through the disarm skill, then Heather can steal it, which is a pretty fun interaction. It's just hard to get going. And Brom is generally only gonna have one chance to proc disarm. So it's not yeah. very likely to proc compared to when someone like, I don't know, Meow or Nephany is using it. But then those people will usually kill the enemies. So it's kinda like do you even want disarm on that unit in the first place? It's gonna do a whole lot. But I've definitely done funny gimmick setups with it, so it's an option. And if you're using Braum, you might as well keep it on him because it's it's funny when it procs. It's just it's just cause for a laugh, basically. Uh, but yeah. he's more of a meme unit that's just really good for early part two, and that's about it for me. Yeah, I do I do kind of like the disarm skill. There's a whole host of items. Like I remember you mentioned the spare hammer mm -hmm. that you can get. Apparently, there's a third hammer you can get if you disarm. I actually didn't know that. I was like, wow, damn. I, 
Maybe I need to go and see what other treasures I can I know disarm. I would recommend having Brom disarm the hammer engine roll, though. <laughs> well, I mean, you can do it from two range with a hand axe, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. Two range? There you go. Ah, details, details, right? Uh, I was going to say, like, this is more talking about the disarm skill. Okay, fine. Yeah, I know you're right. I shouldn't have him disarm the hammer. That seems kind of foolish. <laughs> uh, but there's other things like the bolting tome is kind of fun. That's the only way you can get a bolting in Radiant Dawn is you have to disarm one. Oh, uh, one thing I do. Does that mage have an elf under tome as well? Uh, the one there's like one in 3 2 and there's yeah. one in 3 E. Yeah, I was thinking uh, it's a 3 the, 2 1. Yeah, I think it's also got an elf fire. I mean, whatever, just disarm it, right? Just get, out, just get him out of there. I guess, yeah, you could make him switch to the elf fire. The thing with uh, disarming mages is they tend to die <laughs> if you attack yeah. them. <laughs> well, that's what the bronze sword is for. What do you think that E rank swords is for, man? Yeah, Brom sword? <laughs> the Brom sword, that's right. You gotta, you gotta hit him with it. One thing I do want to bring up about Brom, though, is the water affinity. I'm gonna bring up water affinity on every unit not named Leanne. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it is actually pretty handy because, I mean, Brom, Brom's a nice mainstay unit. Uh, you can put him next to, you know, units like Nephany, units like. Neolushi units like Har, maybe. Uh, Har is always a fun one to give the Brom support to. So there, there's a lot of fun being had with you, with your savior Har with the Brom support. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up. Like, I did that yeah. with Atania before, yeah. Yeah, I mean, water is just a good affinity. Like, it's it's nice to bring up anytime, it comes, anytime a unit has water affinity, right? It's like water, heaven, and earth. Those are the best ones, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think most people would agree about heaven, but we went into that tension before. <laughs> yeah, I, I, what I like about water, I think, and what you like as well, is that the game doesn't round down half the bonuses, it rounds them up instead. So at A support, if you're only getting half attack, you're still getting plus two, which is almost as good as plus three, and really, really powerful in general. Yeah, no, I mean, frankly, that's all I got to say about Brom. <laughs> like, I don't think I've ever promoted this guy, to be honest with you. <laughs> no, that's fair. He died in my last Iron Man, but before we could promote, unfortunately, he died in like 3-10. Unfortunately, I really want to use him again at some point. I cry. I, I cry every time. It's like, there's that, there was a hammer guy that I thought wasn't going to move. Well, spoilers, he moved. Sag. I don't know. Um, that's uh, Heather, I suppose, is next, because she's also in the 2-1, along with Brom and, uh, and Nephany. Uh, she tried yeah. running away from us, but we ended up recruiting her somehow uh, after she stole like, yeah. all her stuff. <laughs> where Where is she in 2-1? Answer, yes. <laughs> She's everywhere. Uh, I, I find Heather a very entertaining unit. The first time, I my Iron Man last month was the first time I actually took her to endgame, but normally she's just Thief Utility for me. And Radiant Dawn is very short on Thief Utility, actually. The, she can steal disarmed weapons, sure, but that's a rare occurrence unless you're trying to set up for it. And then beyond that, it doesn't really have those, you know, the stereotypical GBA map here, where you have like a castle or a fortress, and then inside it is like a couple rooms with chests in it, like a door in front of it, and maybe a thief going for it. That doesn't really happen very often in Radiant Dawn. It's like the Oliver chapter is like that, and not much else. Even though and part three is like thirteen maps, none of yeah, them are that's like it. that. There's there's not a single chest in part three. Yeah, it's it's very strange. Part one even has a couple like that, like it has one E and everything. Part three is just completely devoid. Uh, doesn't mean there's nothing for her to do. Uh, finding hidden items is still very nice because thieves get a chance bonus to find hidden items. You should just find it always, but they get a bonus and I'll be grateful for that part. And uh, the most important ones, uh, I think by far the most important ones are rescue staff in 3E to mm -hmm. uh, get mobility boosts. It's like the only mobility boosting staff in the whole game. Um, things like stealing random skills off of enemies or maybe even Vulns or Elixirs. Uh, it's nice, With of Draco course. Shields. <laughs> yeah, the Draco Shield that we just did, exactly. Stat Boosters, that's a good one. Thanks for bringing that up. And there's like, I think there's some chests in, in all of her chapter, and then there's like one chest in Endgame, but like whatever, you have chest keys as well. So it's not a big deal. It doesn't really help either all that much that those exist. Um, it's kind of about it. Like our combat can be made funnily good, but with a lot of painful investment because her base power is bad. She will attack twice, but two times zero is still, two, still zero, I'm afraid. <laughs> so not a whole lot going for her there. Uh, in theory, the things that help someone like Nephany or Mia or even Janaf get better that are good with high-speed units like Adept or an Energy Drop, they do help Heather, but she's coming from a worse starting position. So it's going to take longer to see results, and as a result, it's not optimal. But I've done it in Iron Man before. It's doable. It's very funny. And uh, yeah, it's, that's that, it was really fun to do for once. But I don't think I'll do it again until I feel like it. <laughs> it's going to take a while for me to feel like it. That's uh, that's yeah. for me. What about you? I'll, I'll have to try training her up one time. I think there was one time where I got her to like 
maybe level 10. I think I've ever, I think there's another unit that I've never promoted. Hmm. Uh, the the rogues and whispers are kind of kind of weird because it's very difficult to make them very powerful in late game since their weapons are just so trash. Right, like I guess the beast killer is kind of cool, but like Soth fights Lagoos, Heather doesn't really. Yeah, to I put guess Soth could... like an entire tier ahead of his peers to make him look good. <laughs> yeah, no, just to and yeah, and then even like at the end of one E, he's actually actually kind of looking pretty bad to be honest. Like mm -hmm. all of these guys are walking around, even Tormod's like kind of styling on him. Yeah, uh, I, I I might as well say like I every single unit is like a couple funny things you can do with this one. Why not bring up this? So stealing the energy drop from Lombroso in I think three five can be a pretty tricky heist sometime. Yeah. But Resolve Heather apparently just completely dodge tanks everything on that map. Oh shit. <laughs> so as long as you get her into resolve range, she's just completely invulnerable. No one ever touches her whatsoever. So <laughs> as long as the other guy who's gonna kill the cab in front of Lombroso ends up dying, you can just totally steal the energy drop. Not oh, not great. even an issue whatsoever. <laughs> that's great. I wanna try that now. I think it's my resolve in the girls? In the girl dudes or is it in and, the is it with the Dom boys? The, and the I don't think we ever took it off of Taraneo, to be honest. I think it's still on him. Oh, that might be the case. We'll we'll see what we'll see what Oyana brought on her shipment, right? So <laughs> true. But yeah, no, I mean that that's basically Heather in a nutshell. There keep keep an eye out for items to steal. You know, I guess if you want to steal the statue frag from three two, then like go ahead, knock yourself out. Oh god, but... that's like in the <laughs> in the middle of a bunch of enemies, isn't it? Like in the bottom. Yeah, right. it's. I think you have to like enter the boss's range, and then next turn maybe you can steal it. Oh god! <laughs> it, it's it's so it's so far in. I'd, I'd I'd never go for it. Understandable. Anything else on Heather? No, nah, not really, to be honest. Okay, fair. Uh, I suppose this is where I'll edit in Lucia before I forget her because she joins along with the rest of these units. Uh, she jo technically joins before Leith and Mordecai, so might as well go over her, right? But mm -hmm. she uh, she went somewhere, so I don't know where she is, but. Uh, I have her. I, I can grab her stats on Oifi real quick, even though they're not super relevant. Because I, all I need to remember really is her performance in the one chapter she's around for for part two, for now. And in that one, the general sum up for me would be: if she has the silver sword equipped, she one rounds everything but armor knights. And if she has the wind edge equipped, then she one rounds mages and maybe archers. Not sure about that one. That's about it. So you can either kill almost everything at one range, or you can kill maybe half the enemies at two range. And with some crits in there to maybe get extra kills. Uh, but she's... I think she's supposed to be like a bit of a Jagan, except you have several units that can kind of already do that, so... She doesn't stand out as much, but she's still obviously better than the Lagoos for not having a gauge, having one-two range options. And she's still substantially better than someone like Braum. So she does stand out, but it's only for one map, and that's it. So as much as I appreciate her, there's not a whole lot to say about Lucia's Part 2 performance. I've never tried... Raising Lucia in part four is one of the few quote unquote bad units that have never reigned, uh, trained to fruition. Um, she's obviously the worst of the Swordmasters at that point in the game because all the other ones joined with similar bases to her, but a lot earlier. Or they're Edward, and at that point, they're probably going to be trained up as well. Uh, or they're just Stefan, they're an entire tier ahead of her. So it's really hard to justify using her unless you just like her, and there's a lot of people that like her, so I don't blame them if they do try. Um, our growths are like pretty good looking actually. It's like 60% speed and 70% skill. So she could probably do the similar tricks to Z-Hark where she caps her skill and speed. And at that point she can probably get some other stats. Uh, I'm noticing that her strength growth is actually only 25%. So yeah, that's uh, trash. It's... That's, that's Shanna's strength growth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> probably. I think Shanna might be 30 actually. <laughs> oh no. She is, uh, which is, unfortunately it's behind her HP uh, and her luck and her res. So the chances you get strength off of Bex is probably not very high until she caps like one other stats as well. So yeah. definitely takes a lot of effort to get her going. At the same time, I know that that base, even on hard mode, there are some enemies that she can double with the 27 or 28 speed she's going to have at that point. So if you're routing a map and she can take like one or two turns to take out like a group of three enemies, along with maybe some other help from other random scrubs, like I know Renolf or something, um, she's probably still, I don't want to say good, but, like, you can put her on a map and have her do something, and it would be okay. It wouldn't hurt you. Uh, but you still have to be careful because her durability at that point is kind of subpar. And on hard mode, you're not going to have weapon triangle over random warrior. So, you'd have to be careful. But there will be something she can do without massive favoritism. But generally, uh, the bulk of her utility is the part 2 map where she's very good. That, that's kind of it for Lucia for me. Yeah, I do think so. You mentioned you've never really brought up, or you've never really trained up a Lucia in part 4. I actually think. 
part four is kind of an interesting time for Lucia to shine. Uh, mostly because I tend to actually give her a Master Crown at that point. Mm. Uh, she's usually the last person in my army to receive a Master Crown is Lucia. Uh, just because she has the female promotion, so she gets the strength plus three and defense plus three, whereas everyone else gets plus two and plus two, or all the males rather get plus two plus two, right? Mm -hmm. So she gets slightly boosted strength compared to what you would normally expect. And her bases are still pretty high that, you know, with a forged silver, she's actually doing like a lot of damage and you have enough cash for forged silvers at that point. Like I know with a forged silver sounds like you're investing a lot into her, but you, you really do have the cash for it. And even if you only use it on her for like the one map or for the two maps, you probably then have the forged silver left over. You can use it some in later on parts in the game as well. So I actually do think she's a very good candidate for a Master Crown in that one. Just for that map, there's a whole lot she can do, and I think her base stats are actually pretty good for that, because she's probably still going to be at base when you get her there. Interesting. As far as other stuff for Lucia goes, the, the innate parity is another thing to maybe bring up, but I honestly don't think innate parity is relevant. No. Because the, the, the whole thing with an innate skill is that it doesn't cost any capacity, so you can have parity in addition to a bunch of other skills. <laughs> but yeah, I, I see where like, you're going. <laughs> where that matters is, like, if you want a unit with parity and a bunch of other skills, you can just, like, put it on a Laguz, and they have better stats than her anyway, so, like, just put it on a Laguz. Like, just put it on a Laguz, basically. Like, I, I don't really think Lucia makes better use of the innate parity than a Laguz, than a Laguz unit would by paying for it, even. All right, I'm so gonna go one step further. From her. Let me ask you this. Why would you want parity and another skill on the same unit? Oh, you got a point there, actually. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had to look this up, though, just to make sure I wasn't saying something stupid. But it says, on command, negates both users and enemies' combat skills, terrain bonuses, and support bonuses. So, it's going to be very few skills you can buy combined with this for utility. There's one thing, though, that I can think of on top of my head. And that would be uh, an out-of-combat skill, like Provoke, for example. You could use it to provoke yeah. enemy spirits to attack her, for example. But again, why would you do that? Instead of do, putting on, say, Gifka or something, right? Yeah. You could also probably put Parody and Provoke on Gifka. So. Yeah, exactly. They probably both fit. Yeah. So. I will say, Parody is like very specifically funny. And it, it actually, if you're bringing Lucy at the end game, I do think Parody would be an okay skill to have on her at that point. Because uh, it's very specific. But generally speaking, you want Parody on someone who's fast enough to double without needing another additional skill for someone else. Because Parody's going to negate that. You don't want to rely on White Pool when you're using Parody. So, and a true blade like Lucia would be after promoting would be a good candidate for that because she can double naturally. So she can hit. Uh, she can also negate enemy terrain bonuses like that, which is also going to be very useful. No spoilers here. So yeah, parity is not really strong for like one map or two maps rather. But yeah, I feel like you just I, I feel like I'm moving it around so much on different units depending on the map that like I don't I, I don't think the innate parity is like very relevant. It's funny. I, I, get it. I ignore parity until end game, and hopefully, I don't forget to put it on someone else that I'm bringing to end game before the oh, end no. basically. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, when I get to the base of end game, I just like remove all weapons and skills from people and just start from scratch, basically. But same. I'm, but the I'm, base I'm... is so laggy; it's annoying. <laughs> like, you don't only have to take parity off of Lucia, but you also have to deposit the item in your convoy. Right? Oh yeah, and then there's like, I, I, have you ever filled up that convoy? <laughs> uh, I can't say I have, but maybe I have done it a couple. I've done it a couple times. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It's like, it's 300 items. It's like, dude, seriously. The but, game starts chugging. <laughs> I know. Poor but game. She, she's all right. She's all right. Oh, Earth Affinity, too. I forgot. Oh, um, yeah. But, like, the first time you can build a support is, like... Yeah, it's awkward. 4-5? Yeah, you don't want to build a support with someone in, in the part two and then have it with someone that leaves for most of the game. <laughs> yeah. Like, great. Oh, you gosh. have... Plus eight avoid and four dash five. Cool. Mm -hmm. and you should probably could get him to like. No, you can't even get. I was gonna say build up with Lucia. That's the only units around. But they added. They don't share a map in part two. So rip. Rip. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a. That is a rip on multiple levels. Uh, shall we move on to Khalil then? Because I think we're going to Khalil. Lucia. Uh, almost hit the right button there. Uh, Khalil is only around for two E in part two, so she's barely a part two unit in the first place. And then she's not around until the Crimean Royal Knights come back. She's along with uh, Joffrey and Kieran and the other guys that were maybe getting into this episode. I'm about to discuss that. Um, she's decent in to end game just because she has meteor. Like no matter where Khalil is, she can contribute some chip damage somewhere. And I usually hoard the meteor because it's it only has five uses. 
But at the same time, I really learned in this past 2e run that Meteor can be quite valuable if you just spend it wisely. And I used two uses here that I think I'm never going to get better value than that. So I'm going to try to hoard a little bit less from here now. It is the first pitfall. I do got to learn to let go sometimes. Uh, but yeah, Meteor is very fun. There are some occasions where Khalil can attack with the other tomes, like if she's perfectly safe. It's either going to be from up a ledge or from behind a bulkier unit like Brahm or Mordecai or Har. Um, she still have to be careful because if the enemy's moving the right way, she could still be in danger. Usually still she survived like one physical hit, so if there's one sniper that attacks her, that's fine, I guess. Uh, but beyond that, it gets very tricky. If the longbow gets involved or if she kills the enemy and another enemy comes up, she's probably dead. So you have to be a little bit careful there. Uh, but if you can get her to fire from up ledge, that's completely safe and completely fine. And she's going to do more damage than something like Nephany with a javelin. So there's some utility there, but generally for me, it's all Meteor and 2e. Then she's not around for a while, and then you come back to 3-9. And in 3-9, you have her, and then the Crimea Royal Knights, like Joffrey, Kira, and Denevet and stuff. And from there, I guess you have to ask the question, like, am I using Khalil for the chip damage, and for like a little bit of help, and being able to climb up ledges that almost no one else can do? Or do I just um, train her to like, go favoritism? And if you want to do favoritism, the Crimea Royal Knights have some funny tools. Uh, part 3, when you have the Crimea Royal Knights for one chapter, you can actually move skills around and you can give them Paragon, for example. You have two Paragon skills, one on Astrid, one on Joffrey. If you're not using them long term, then you definitely don't need Paragon. So you can give it to her, get her more levels. Uh, there's some other skills you can probably put on them too. I don't remember off the top of my head what the next best one. Probably Adept would be the next best one. You can buy one of those in 3.9. But I think generally, Khalil just wants Paragon then. Uh, give her as many levels as you can before eventually giving her a Master Crown or Beck Springer up or something. And then she can be like a favoritism, like project kind of unit for next bit of part three until she's like completely uh tier three ready to kill enemies on her own in part four i've never done that i don't know how good Khalil is that that kind of thing she seems a bit too frail to do that for a while but if you wanted to use her like actually use her full time that's probably the path she would take she's probably okay at it sages are not very good in this game but if you're gonna get one and pull a bunch of like favoritism into them i guess Khalil could be an okay candidate um not a whole lot else to say Nihil is kind of similar to Parody in that you're not really using it until endgame, I think. So you should just leave it on her and then take it off for endgame and put it on someone else. Because I've never used Khalil full-time. How about you? Yeah, there, I think I've used Khalil full-time once just because I was like, I want to cast the Rex Flame Tome. <laughs> and <laughs> my, my alternative was like Tormod and Sonaki, and Sonaki's already got one. And um, Tormod. But anyway, so Khalil, I, I, I think I did. And I, like she was okay. It's like a Sage and Radiant Dawn. They kind of have like lowish stats everywhere, so they're kind of tricky to use. But I don't know, she was cool in the desert map. That's that, that's basically the only map where she was really shining. So I, w I was about to say I will say some funny thing, but I, I do want to qualify first. Like this is like extremely niche, extremely niche. Uh, but once upon a time, I found a one turn for two dash e that did get the energy drop. <laughs> <laughs> But you had to bonus XP Khalil to get a single point of magic in order to get it. So, the hell is it? A, like, is it a crit on Lutvek or something with Elfire or with the Meteor? No, no, Har does it. But Khalil has to like dive bomb the Armor Knight down there with the Elfire. Like she doubles it, but she's one point short. <laughs> so, so you like you you dance her and you shove. This this was the same strat where I figured out Leanne can die and it doesn't matter because she dies in that clear. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I just moved her down. It's like, oh, hey, look at that. Uh, Elfire can, but she, she needs one point of strength. I do think there is something she can do to the boss of 3-9, where she can give you a really fast clear. Uh -huh. If, again, you Bexper and get her a couple points of magic, then she can just double Meteor the boss down, and that actually takes him out really easily, which is kind of nice, because that boss has 1-2 range and a lot of crit. So I guess if you're if you're really afraid of that boss, maybe you're Iron Maning and you're really afraid of that boss, you can just stack up some magic on Khalil. Like, research the benchmark. Stack up however magic you need on Khalil, and then just double Meteor him down, and it's totally safe. It's rather nice. Uh, that's pretty much the utility as far as like Khalil being a uniquely placed mage goes. And then once she joins back up with the Grail Mercs, she's right next to Sorin, who's basically better than her in every way. And it's not like you're really dying for a ton of mages in the Grail Mercs, I tend to find. Like you, you have Sorin and Reese, and they basically have everything covered that you could possibly want, right? So it, it, it's kind of hard for me to make place in my mind for Khalil after that point. Definitely. I think the Rex Flame niche is really just 
people, that's probably the thing people mention the most about, about her, is being one of the few people who can actually SS rank fire, but it's such a minor thing in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's super relevant. Okay, mm -hmm. um, raisins, we're roughly an hour in, and we do have a lot of Crimean Royal Knights. Do you think we can squeeze them in, or should we save them for a separate video? What, how's your uh, energy levels? I, I got some energy, why don't we do them? Alright, let me load the save then. So we have six units here on the Crimean Royal Knights, and one of them stands out as different as Marcia because she's around four. Two prologue, whereas the rest only joins in 2-3, Joffrey's charge. So we'll go over her now. One day I will learn the right button to input for the right stream. Yeah. <clears throat> One day. Um, One day. Marcia, may she rest in peace, because uh, I killed her after the save. She died. Uh, second unit on the death counter, along with Leonardo. Sorry to say. Uh, I wasn't really planning on using her long term anyway, but it just kind of sucked not to have a flyer for the rest of her availability, because she's the only one for a little bit. Uh, in 2 Prologue, she's one of many flyers there, and like I said, 2 Prologue is kind of a... You can't really improve it a whole lot. Anything Marcia does is defending Leanne or self-improvement, that's basically it. Uh, if I'm talking about Alicia healing someone, it's probably Marcia, because you know, she's never getting hit, and Har barely needs healing in the first place. So it's generally just keeping Marcia alive, that is what Alicia does in that chapter. And uh, Marcia is like, okay, she's like two rounding enemies with the Leanne help, that's basically one rounding. It's, it's okay, but it's a defend map, so it doesn't really matter for anyone but Marsha herself. 2-3, very different for her though, because there she is the most flexible unit on the map by far, because she can fly whereas everyone else is on a horse or the Dunvet. And what I'd like to do with her is what I demonstrated in the clear itself, is just parking her next to terrain, distracting enemies while having Marsha unequipped so that the enemies don't die and I get more backs for that. And then if she's in danger, fly her away somewhere else, maybe heal her and make enemies move around a little bit to make it harder for them to go stalemate because I want their abilities to be spaced next to Marcia so that enemies that would attack someone else go for her instead. Uh, it, it's kind of weird to explain it like this with no map here, but I, th I think if you watch the 2-3 clear, you can kind of see how it worked well. Uh, you can also see when it doesn't work well, which is when she dies. Her durability is not infinite, it's, uh, it's actually pretty bad. Uh, I didn't realize just how mortal she was until she died on me there. I think she might have been in bad biorhythm when she did. Uh, I usually don't have problems with her durability as long as I keep topping her off, but she's vulnerable. It's, if she's a to exposed to like 3-4 attacks every turn and all don't connect, then yeah, she'll probably die. And that's not mentioning crossbows or bows like that, because obviously I'm going to keep her out of range of those, but if they're on the map, they heavily restrict where she where she goes. Like the top area of 2-3 with the two crossbow warriors, it's very dangerous for her until you, cre you clear those out. Once you do clear those out, she can maybe help out, but generally speaking, keep her away from those. And then 2-E, um, she's like... Having a flyer round that is not a Laguz uh, or Lincia or Har is nice because she can do anything that you just need wings for, nothing else. So something like dropping Heather off to do the Dragon Shield heist, or rescue dropping Leanne out of uh, to safety, uh, or rescue dropping someone else to safety, like getting Nefity to some places, getting maybe if someone is stuck in a bad deployment spot, you can rescue them off with Marcia. Little things like that, it's just nice to have her around for, and Leanne being around makes her easy to use there too. Uh, her combat is like Nefini level, if not a bit worse. So usually not worth using unless you're in an emergency. Uh, but just being able to fly around and do rescue stuff, it's like having Shanna in an FP10 map, really. Yeah. And then she's not around for a bunch of maps, and then in 3-9, um, it's like her last time to be the only flyer on the map. Uh, there's a couple places she can get to that no one else can. It's nice to sort of use her to like, uh, extinguish houses, uh, or like rescue drop Khalil or Danvet maybe sometimes. It's very small, and her combat isn't very good at that point anymore. Uh, if you invested into her, maybe if you got transfers from Path of Radiance, this is where you start investing into her. You do the same thing as you do in uh, with, with Khalil that I mentioned before. You can put Paragon on her. Uh, you might reserve like the 3-9 crown for her, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. And then she can turn into like a, a Seraph Knight, a tier 3 promotion of the Falcon Knight. And she can be sort of a combat unit, but I've always found that the Pegasus Knights in Radiant Dawn, uh, or the Falcon Knights, uh, if they're not Alincia, they're generally a little bit underwhelming for me. Like, I can see that on paper their stats are fine and good enough to do, like, chip damage. Uh, but they're always, like, steps behind Har in so many different ways. Like, they're less bulky, they have a worse uh, typing weakness, uh, they uh, do less damage both because of lower strength, and they have lower might on their weapons, javelins are less accurate than hand axes. They're just more flawed all around, and that makes them feel worse to use. Um, even worse than someone like Janaf or Alki, for example, other flyers that have all the problems that the Goose have, but they still feel better to use because her stats are just so much better. So I find it hard to justify using the, the Falcon Knights in this game uh, after their initial joining chapters. Um, but I can see where she would be useful if you put a lot more investment into them 
and deny that. I've never gone full Martia, you know what I mean? I've never really invested into Martia in this game. Uh, I am going through a normal playthrough right now where I do plan to do that. Uh, because I drafted her in FE10, but not in FE9. But I just vexed her up all the way in, from base level to level 2020 um, to uh, cap, like, I think, skill with speed and I think strength. So maybe she'll be better for me there. So maybe that'll change my mind. But right now, I'm not super high on Martia as a combat unit. I just think her flying utility is good. What about you? Yeah, I, I do think the flying utility is pretty much the entire story of Marsha. Like, she she can sometimes kill a random cab with a horse's lair. And by a random cab, I actually mean, like, a really important one with the mm -hmm. horse's lair of his own, right? Like, it's the mirror matchup, but one of us is weak to it. Yeah. So, <laughs> right? It's, it's a bit unfair in that regard. And I do think she's pretty useful there for that combat. In all of her other combat, yeah, frankly, she's pretty dubious. It's... It, it, it's pretty hard to invest in her to such a degree where her combat is useful. And I know here's the thing, right? Like, I, I think the the first thing you can bring up, because you said you don't find the Pegasus Knights that impressive next to horror. And I think my counter my counter argument would be exactly from one of your Pitfall videos, where, like, there's nothing wrong with having more of a good thing. The issue is that with Marsha, like, there's already so much of that. Like, you have horror and you have Tanith and Seagrun. Apparently you don't like I'm actually a huge fan of Tanith and Seagrin, actually. I think they're both really good. Uh, you have Gen F and Olki. Like, at this point, you're talking about the sixth best flyer. And Marsha's stats are basically an entire promotion behind the worst of them. Yeah. It's... yeah, And, and she's she starts at level 5. Does she not, or does this one have a level? Hold up. Um, let's see. I think she was only in two prologues so far. She might have two levels on her, because two prologue is a lot of her thing enemies. Yeah. But, she, uh, she only earned, she yeah. didn't earn a level at all in 2 Prologue, actually her base is 5. Yeah, if I can briefly expound on your point there, because there's one thing I actually really wanted to say about this. Uh, it's like, yeah, sure, worse than hard, whatever. Uh, the other thing is that I think flying utility and good combat are both really good, but when you have them combined, it creates a unit that is so magnificently, like, many magnitudes better than everything else. Um, and if you reverse that and you go, okay, if you have a flyer that doesn't have combat, that doesn't have good combat, it feels so much worse to have a unit like that because, well, you, you think about how much useful, how useful this unit will be if they can go anywhere and kill everything. But instead with Marcia, it's like, uh, I see like one enemy with a bow there. I think I'm just not going to go into the general area at all. You know what I mean? They're yeah, so restricted no, can't in comparison. Do that. <laughs> so, and again, like, it, it kind of reminds me of the Khalil situation where I'm like, oh, well, Khalil can do all these nice things on the Crimean Royal Night maps, on the Part 2 maps, and on 3 9 and whatnot. She can do all these really nice things. And then she joins the Grail Mercs, where, like, Soren and Reese are basically already doing everything that you would ever allocate to her. Marsha's like that, except literally, like, three times worse because there's that many more units that's doing all the things that you would have allocated to her. So it's. There is something to be said, actually, for the army split, because, like, you might say, well, five flyers is kind of a lot. Yeah, but there's three routes you got to send them to. And when you do the army split, I actually think allocating her for triangle attack could be a fun way to continue getting use out of her. Mm -hmm. uh, just because a lot of the maps where she can go to have, you know, there there are cab enemies that she can triangle attack horses layer with. There are wyvern enemies that she can, tri that she can triangle attack worm slayer with. Uh, there's a lot of just fun stuff you can do as far as that goes, but that's pretty much the extent of her utility past the Crimean Royal Knight maps, like past 3-9, that's basically the only thing I can think of where she's really contributing that much. For sure. Okay. Um, what is Joffrey next, I guess? Why not? Why not? Alright. Let's get it with Joffrey. Uh, so Joffrey is probably the strongest pound-for-pound, pound, like strength points-for-strength point unit on the Crimey Royal Knights. His, he does the most damage, I think, out of everyone. Unless you're attacking a door, <laughs> he's just so, so powerful. Uh, he has his own Brave Lance, which he's very proud of, and it just uh, turns everything into fine red mist whenever he attacks it. Uh, at least in part two. Part three is when he becomes a bit more mortal, he's thus, like, invincible. Uh, I should mention, uh, I'm talking about him in, like, 2-3, where most of the enemies are, like, designed to be very weak because you don't want to kill them. But there's a couple of enemies that you do want him to kill, like the uh, the warriors, uh, maybe the horse slayer paladin if you get your own horse slayer, the boss. He's very good against those. Uh, 2E, we didn't see him, but he's technically around if you stay around the map long enough. It's just they're often in a little corner, so even though they are there, it takes them a while to even get to where everything else is happening. So it feels like they're in their own subchapter almost. And I generally find him like okay there, like he does a couple things, but it's mostly self improvement. Uh, the enemies are so far below him that the fact that he has Paragon doesn't even really matter. Like he's getting two XP instead of one for killing an enemy. Like okay, whatever, dude. Yeah. <laughs> cool. What a thrill. Uh, yeah, exactly. He's like, oh, I got attacked by a ranged enemy. I didn't counter. Also two XP. Let's go. Cool. 
Um, and then he disappears until 3-9. He's again the best unit there probably. Uh, kills a lot of things. Um, the thing with Joffrey that you gotta remember is that after that he's not around until 4-5. Whereas every other unit that we're gonna discuss from here on out is around uh, for 3-11 and onwards in the Grill Mercenaries. And then you get the whole army split. But Joffrey's not part of all that. So he loses a big chunk of availability. And this is a big deal. Because it makes investing into Joffrey beyond 3-9 very dubious to me. Uh, you can do it to make 3-9 less painful. Joffrey improves a lot from, for example, getting the Master Crown you get in 3-9. Or maybe like a Bex level to get another Strength level up. Because chances are he didn't even level up. Uh, it, maybe he levels from the boss, but that's about it. So like getting a little bit of investment to him can be nice for those maps. But it's only for 3-9 that you're really doing it. Uh, he doesn't care about it in 2-E. So it's like... You don't really care about it, and it feels bad to do it, but at the same time, I know 3-9 can be a big headache. Uh, especially for me, because I lost Marcia, so maybe I'll do it anyway. Uh, I generally don't like it, but at the same time... Because, like, that crown is big. Like, you can give it to a Grim Mercenary who just wants to promote, and they're dumb Bex being up, for example. Like, I don't know, if Mia's capped all her stats, I just want to promote her, so I want to get that crown to her in 3-11. Uh, so... I don't really like crowning Joffrey that much, but at the same time, I know how much it improves his combat because he's like right on the cusp of doubling enemies and he's right on the cusp of two killing them with the Brave Lance. It's just, I want to get him that little push, but I don't like crowning him because I, I want to get the crown for someone else. How do you usually handle that? And how do you like Joffrey in general? Yeah, I, so I, I guess I'll begin with like the 3-9 Master Crown thing because it's basically him and Kieran, right? Like maybe you vexed Danved and you did... Yeah, yeah it's, master I think it's them, or you just keep it for the Grimmers, personally. Yeah, or you keep it. To be honest, lately I'm kind of a fan of keeping it for the Grail Mercs. Uh, I, 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 you know what? I'm really, I'm really torn 50-50 on this because, on the one hand, like having a promoted units in three nine. It, it is a tricky chapter, I'm not going to lie. And even even like a single soul proc that like kills an enemy and heals you to full can actually be a pretty massive swing. And that whole entire thing. And of course, the plus two to all stats is just crazy. It does significantly improve your combat. It does significantly improve your bulk. And so just having a promoted unit in that map it is really good. I enjoy doing that. But I remember, so before for the longest time, I only ever Master Crown Jeffrey. And then recently, I did a Master Crown Kieran. Mm -hmm. And what I found out is that in all my runs where I Master Crown Jeffrey, Kieran was fine. And in all my runs where I Master Crown Kieran, Jeffrey was fine. So, like, do I actually really need it? Mm -hmm. Both of these units are honestly kind of serviceable. Well, were like, they fine I... because you had the other at Tier 3, though? I mean, honestly, I, I, I can't really say that they were. Like, I was kind of allocating them to the same tasks. And, like, when one got injured, I still pulled them back to heal. And when they fought, it was still teaming up. It was still, like taking several turns to get through them and whatnot. I wasn't LTCing the map by any means, so I'm sure if you're LTCing, like you probably do need to put on that master crown in order to like meet your benchmarks and whatnot. But you know, I, I was still kind of using the same cautious approach, and even honestly, even promoting Kieran with a master crown, I didn't really think was actually that good. But I'm gonna kind of save that to Kieran. Mm -hmm. So to be honest with you, I don't really think the difference is that great it, the, I, I don't really think the difference of their combat is so great to really write home about the master crown i think you can totally afford to save it for the grail mercs That's especially fair. when you talk about a unit like jeffrey who you promote jeffrey and he's only using it for that map like he, he's only using it for that map you're you don't care about silver knight jeffrey on 4-5 <laughs> it's not even a good map for him it's like a bunch of swamp tiles yeah, he, he he's around for one third of a map in part four. <laughs> like, yeah, and then he's also like a bad candidate for endgame. So it was really just I, I don't want to use falling off because it's a cliche, but it's really not. No, he does. not there. <laughs> he no, he does. He does fall yeah. off. Like it's that simple. All right. Um, so on, honestly, yeah, I'm not a fan of master crowning. I'm just mm -hmm. just get better at three nine. I guess <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we can further talk about this with Kieran. Sure, I sure. think Kieran Kieran's the next one. Yeah, sure. Uh, so. Kieran, I mean, at first glance, it's like, is it have Joffrey with axes? I think his strength is a bit lower, but axes have higher might, so it kind of compensates. I think they have the same speed. Let me just double check that. Yeah, they have the same speed at base, uh, yeah. which is amusing to me. Uh, the more I'm discussing this Master Crown, the more I'm liking Kieran over Joffrey for the Master Crown. Either that or keeping it for the Mercs, like you said. Uh, but 
I think the advantage with Kieran, of course, is that you get a tier 3 unit that you can also use for the Gromarks. But I do remember that the Gromarks still have a lot of units that could compete with unit Kieran for the unit slot and probably win that competition because long term he's not that good. Like, he's okay, I guess. I don't have much experience using Kieran in, in part 4, especially not with a Master Crown. Uh, outside of like a draft race that was on easy mode, so it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but that's that base is of 20, it's sufficient for 2-3 three, three for sure. It doubles most, but not all the enemies there. And the other enemies that you want to fight anyway. And then in 3-9, it doesn't really double anything. I think that matters, but no one does. So it's, you kind of have to piece together kills anyway. And if you get the crown on him, he might double a little bit more. That's probably useful. And then, I mean, you get a 3-11 with a unit that's grown like... Let's say he's grown like 2 points of speed. It's probably being generous. He's 22 speed. Uh, Ike's base speed is a little shaky, and he's got that's 23. So, yikes! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, he's in trouble there. It's like Oscar's. I think Oscar's faster at base. It's geez, it's not good. And that's the, a the lifelong rivalry. rival. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I I do like the fact that he can use axes, which are obviously like a super important part of any unit that wants to be the best ever. Uh, but this game is also not very kind to him terrain wise. There's only a couple routes in part four that he wants to go on that would really work for him. Um, and honestly, all of them have anti-horse uh, meta somewhere. I think is it, actually is he forced on the Alincia part with Tibarn, or am I misremembering um, that? I think I, I remember that. I I've always put him in that army. Yeah. But I don't actually. I don't think he's forced in there. We'll see. I guess. We'll I, I, see. I actually have, I actually have no idea. I don't think it's super relevant because you probably. You could send him on Ix, but I think the enemies there are too strong, and he struggled with the ledges, and Titania's there anyway, so he's probably kind of overlapping utility there, so you probably don't want to send him on Ix, and you definitely don't want to send him on Makaya, so kind of left with Tibarans at that point anyway, right? Yeah, no, I mean, all the part 4 armies have a map where Cavs suck, like, just deal with it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think the Tibaran one is the easiest one to deal with, you just have him in the forest, whatever, it's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple paths between there, you can put him on. And then three nines, okay, whatever, it's fine. And then between three nine and part four, there's obviously some Grim Mercenaries map, but like I said, he's not really beating anyone at the competition there, I think. there's If you're trading someone who's still bad at that point, they're probably worse than Kieran, but other than that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I guess one thing you could do, instead of crowning him, you could make him your favoritism unit, like I said before, give him Paragon, level up as much as possible, and then maybe... But I still think it's going to be worse long term overall. So he's basically just a, a Joffrey with more availability, but that availability isn't very good. So mm. it's about as good, I think, as, as Joffrey is, which is like, good for when he's around as long as a few units. And then once more competition arrives, he's just kind of uh, whatever, dude. It's okay. Yeah, I guess we'll take it. It's yeah, like mediocre. He's, he's all right. I actually I hadn't really thought of the transferring Paragon over to Kieran, but honestly, I, I actually really like that idea. Because the thing is, you could put Paragon on Kieran, use him as your favoritism unit. And if the project is a flop, then like whatever, you just take it off of him and put it on the Grail Marks next map, right? Yeah. So it's, it's like, what else are you doing with this Paragon, right? Yeah, you have to take so, it off of Joffrey because if you don't, you're gonna lose it for until four five. So you have to put it on someone else, probably. Might as well be Kieran. Yeah, pa Paragon Jeffrey. It's so it's just so trash. Like just don't do it. <laughs> but like, whoa, an eight Paragon, what a throw. But having it, having it having it on Kieran actually is like a rather big help, I would say, and. I think maybe the better strategy would actually just be to Paragon Kieran. You know, he, he'll he probably get two or three levels in 3-9, and you can just see what he gets, right? Maybe he gets, like, a whole promotion worth of sets, which is, like, kind of the dream, but maybe it happens. In which case, yeah, by all means, give him a crown and have him go ham, but then just evaluate him when he actually arrives at the Grail Mercs and decide whether or not he's one of the units you want to get the Master Crown to. It's the kind of thing where I think putting the Master Crown on him straight away, again, if you're kind of like trying to do some efficient player LTC then putting a crown on somebody is really important but I remember I think I put a crown on him and then he just immediately goes into the same army that Titania and Horror is in and he's just weaker than both of those than the both of they were at base so it's really hard to justify that kind of expense on Kieran he just doesn't do anything with it yeah I have one justification for it which is that uh, yeah you can be better at 3-9 but when you're playing Ignorance right it's a bit of a different ball game because you don't know exactly what is what and you have to be very mm. careful with your units because 3-9 is designed in such a way that it's like a challenge for all the units that you're using but if you don't know how much your damage you're dealing with, how much you're getting in return you'd really want to have that stat boost for an extra buffer and safety right and that salt rock you can occasionally get so i'm still kind of leaning towards giving a crown to someone there and Kira might be the best candidate because you know you don't want to give it to joffrey and 
you know, what else is left, right? Dunvet, I guess. <laughs> Tier 3 Dunvet and 3 Knight is like, carry us through. I mean, to be honest... Uh, you could double with it, maybe. Hmm. maybe yeah. Hmm. Okay, He's I'll got add. better speed. Oh, damn, now, now I want to talk about Dunvet. I guess we could take a break Let's from the Cavs with uh, talking about Dunvet. Let's talk about Dunvet, then. Yeah. Alright, so... Uh, uh, Dunvet, I know he's supposed to be on a mascot. I've tried to shy away a little bit from, from Dunvet and, and, and Devdun lately because honestly, I don't look anything like them. And it's a little bit strange to people seeing him as my self insert, but I do really appreciate his sense of humor and his conversation still. I do, he's still one of my favorite characters in the game. Just want to have that out there. And mm -hmm. I like the uniqueness that he brings to the table in the, in the, Crimean Royal Knights because he's not on a horse, like unlike everyone else. Like even Marcia is on a special horse. Uh, but Dunfet just moves around. I guess Khalil, but she's only in 2e and 3 knights or whatever. Um, I just like the fact that he's not weak to horse slayers. He can climb up on ledges. He can uh, fight enemies without being weak to anything in particular, like Marcia, who's weak to bows, and just kind of stand his ground. He's also a little bit faster than the rest. I'm noticing now that his base speed is only one higher than Joffrey and Kieran, but somehow that, is, that was enough to not get him doubled by the boss in 2 3. And there's probably a couple of other occasions where that one speed makes a big difference. Uh, he's a bit of a crit bonus to his attacks as well. Uh, it's only five, but it goes up, I think, when he goes to Sentinel in tier three. And he's also going to get, um, I think it's Luna on the Halberd in this game. Where's it? It's Impale. It's Impale. It's, it's okay. Impale, yeah. Times four damage. Yeah. yeah. Big difference maker, I know. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. What a thrill. Uh, I know that Dunvet, uh, like all the other Crimean Royal Knights, he doesn't compare favorably to Grimmarks when they merge. Uh, so when his unique utility is kind of worn off, it's not that great. But the more I'm thinking about it, the more I enjoy the idea of crowning him in 3-9, having him be the front runner. Uh, the one thing I'm afraid of, though, is that Dunvet, I like to send him off on his own little ledge in 3-9, where you can usually send like Khalil and uh, Marcia as well. And he does, he does his thing there, and with his bases, he can do that fine. Uh, it's Joffrey and Kieran who usually end up in more trouble when they're going on their own routes, uh, where I think you would also send Master, Astrid and Makalov. Um, they, I think they need the stat boost more with what they're doing. But I guess if you have a more Dunvet centered clear in mind, then we could maybe try Master Crowning him. It actually seems very amusing to me. Yeah. <laughs> I do know that, uh, like I said, his stats fall off. I remember one time I was using him in normal mode. And I tried using him in in, two, in three E in three end game, and he was he got doubled by like the first helper year I saw. I was like, oh no, this is not good. <laughs> this is not oh good. Oh my goodness! Abort, abort. <laughs> he could definitely still fall off, but uh, if you give him enough, enough favoritism to him, I'm sure he can be fine. His uh, his class is one of the better ones for part four at least. He's not weak to any kind of lich shenanigans or anything. So there's some fun things you could do with him, uh, but he's definitely worse than Nephany, for example, when you're talking like long term stats, but. You know, it's Dunvet. It's, it's, if you think it's funny enough, you can still use them. What do you think of Dunvet? Yeah, I think, I mean, you mentioned his long-term stats. Honestly, I think his bases are even, like, worse than Nephany's, to be honest, mm -hmm. frankly. Like, his, his strength is one point higher, I think, and his, his defense and res are just lower. <laughs> like, that's... He, he has more strength, that's it. Yeah. I guess, like, he is closer to promotion if that matters for you, but again, his availability is just so sporadic that it's really hard for me to look at this unit and be like, yes, this is the best Halberdier. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, at the end of the day, you know, kind of giving him the same treatment that I gave Khalil and Marsha. Yeah, it, it is nice that you have this unit who is slightly faster than the other guys and isn't weak to Force Slayer, right? Or isn't weak to Bow or isn't weak to Crossbow mm -hmm. and can climb ledges. So that's basically the story of Donved. He does fine at what he needs to do but i mean i'm gonna be on he feels like a kind of a generic unit because like he doesn't double anything nobody doubles him right they just each attack each other for some damage and it feels like it's like some green units fighting is what it really feels yeah like. he goes even with the enemies but then there's like eight enemies to one player unit right yeah so you just you, you just end up sitting in the corner swallowing bones the whole time right uh -huh. I mean, to be fair <laughs> that's what you wanted for even two three so he does that very admirably Fair enough. So yeah, we did, he did pretty well at that. Yeah. It is it is nice. We we did actually demonstrate very nicely that he doesn't get doubled by the boss in two three, and that's actually a pretty important you know quality. In case you show up and you still only have twenty speed, Danvet's the man for the job. Yeah, that was. Cute. But that, that's a that's about it as far as I can think of for Danvet. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. We'll see if uh, that's that story to be continued or if this is where Danvet's real one ends. I do want to kind of master crown Danvet. <laughs> I want to do it now. I want to do it right now too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we've been a little mean to horses. Prepare for a little bit more of that because uh, here's Makalov, and uh, he has like every negative tra trait that Kieran has, and Joffrey, I guess, as well, but minus the availability problem in Joffrey. But he has all those, but then his bases are also worse than Dunvet's in every way. Like his uh, 80 strength, 80 speed is far below what you would want 
for you know to compensate for being on a horse. I can't believe we're saying this in a fire emblem review, but we are. Uh, he's not any, any. He doesn't have any good redeeming factors. Even his personality sucks. Uh, there was one guy who bribed me to use Makarov in 311, not for anything specific like killing. He wanted me to put Makarov in every single pitfall on the map and then kill him. No, off. No. <laughs> and so I did, and that was how, Don, how Makarov ended his life in that run. Oh, very, no. very good purpose for uh, using him. Uh, I think his growths are pretty good, but uh, I think his third tier class has some capping problems that we haven't even brought up for the Paladins because of all the other issues they have, uh, like availability, inability to clap ledges, being weak to horses layer, uh, lack of movement on like other terrain like swamps and forests. That are just a couple things that we've already gone over that Bakalov has to deal with as well. Uh, but again, if you want to invest into him, you can give him Paragon. Uh, you can train him in 3-9 as much as he wants. As long as you can set up kills for him, that will probably work out fine. There might be some enemies that you don't kill with like a combined hit of like Makalov plus one of the others. Uh, but I wouldn't know the first thing about that because I've never tried and I've never really felt a desire to. So he's like, he's probably usable if you really want to, but it's uh, he's got some bad unit field because that problem that Dunford has where he like goes like even with the enemy, I think Makalov has it even worse, personally. I've never really been tempted to uh, try and change that perspective. Have you? No, to be honest. I think there was like one time where... I, I, th I think it was in my lowest XP deployment run. He was my highest level unit as a level 12 paladin that I brought to endgame. <laughs> and <laughs> and he, he didn't really redeem himself whatsoever. He's bad class. I don't think it's bad weapon type. Yeah. Like... He, you thought going from lances to a from axes to lances is bad. Oh boy, like at least the th so the thing with other sword classes, right, is that at, at least true blade has crit plus twenty, right? So at least like the uh, the foot sword units have something in addition. And Astra is a nice combat art; it basically kills each time. At least the foot sword masters have something going for them. The guys on horses just they don't double. They, they don't double, they don't deal damage, and Makalov here, I mean, like, his defense is just kind of trash, frankly, yeah. too. Like, he, he's, again, he feels like a generic. I, I will bring so. up, though, in the defense of Makalov, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but if we're talking mastery skills, I do think Soul is one of the better ones in this game, because there's an effect in addition to, to killing, which is healing. <laughs> in addition to killing them? Yeah, he Fair, I mean, like, I, I guess so. Even with Makalov, it's like actually kind of dubious whether or not the soul's going to kill, though, right? Because again, he's using swords. Even if you're using a forge, isn't it triple damage as well? Like critical? I yeah, guess. but it's only triple damage. So yeah, I guess I've never had a. I've had masteries fail to kill before, but I don't remember who it was and what their stats is compared to Makalov's. Well, the thing is, like, I would like look at his look at his strength, right? Like that's Lucia's base strength. Lucia gets times five. He gets times three. Yeah, true. So and she has a higher promo gain. So it's like, I, I don't know if this is Z-Hark's base strength too, but at, the, at this point, I'm, I'm using too much data. The point is, like, <laughs> it doesn't really do a whole lot, it's fair. frankly. I do think that uh, if you want to make Makalov slightly more useful in his own map, a good thing to do is just to purchase a steel blade from the shop. You can go into the armory and you, you can purchase a steel blade if you want. That's probably the best purchase for him. Uh, it just increases his damage by a pretty meaningful amount. And that is something you can do to improve his performance in the maps where he's forced. Uh, the accuracy is kind of shaky for 3-9, but you've already got the Steel Sword, so just use whichever of Steel Sword or Steel Blade is better. And it's not like Steel Blade is a terrible weapon to have for, you know, 3-11 and onwards anyway, so once he falls into the Grail Mercs, you're, like, totally fine. So I do think purchasing the Steel Blade is the correct investment for Makalov. I agree. What does he, what does he get when he gets, uh, he gets Gold Knight, right? So Axis? Yeah, he gets C axes. Okay, that's not. It could be worse, I guess. I think the swords are pretty shit for most of the game. I do think for end game, swords is not terrible because at least there are a lot of high rank swords you could want to use for end game. So like, if you don't have him use Alondite or uh, what's the other one you get? Uh, uh, Vodkati. Yeah, but that one. Uh, you can also also use a Worm Slayer. So like, he has a couple of options there at least. But until then, yeah, swords pretty shit. Uh, okay, can we can we can we be done with Makalov? <laughs> yeah, we've said enough. Okay, um, I have Astrid here. Uh, if you didn't watch my Iron Man playthrough of Radiant Dawn, you might be surprised where you hear this, but I think my Astrid is probably the most fun unit to use out of all these units, besides maybe Dunved in some occasions. Really? Yeah, I uh, someone made me use her. Uh, I think she was supposed to bring. I think Peeved bribed me to bring her to Endgame and get her to use a double bow or something, and. I got kind of the same vibes from FE9 Astrid. Obviously, her stats are much, much worse. Like, no misconceptions here. Her stats are awful, and Paladin is a bad class and all that stuff. 
but um, being a bow paladin means you can get away with worse stats because being able to fire from two range from behind your auto units, it's so much easier to pick off like weakened enemies and go to safety from there uh, than it is for any other class. And as long as your expectations are sufficiently low that yeah, this unit needs, unit needs enemies to be single digit HP and pretty bad defense to be able to kill them. But once you've got that in your mind, Using her doesn't feel all that bad. Like, yeah, you're training, you're training a shitty unit, but at least it's a shitty unit that has, like, a super low level and Paragon, like, in a Paragon, actually. So, mm -hmm. she still grows pretty fast. And, uh, you know, in the end, you get actually you can actually get a viable endgame unit because her, her ceiling is very high. It takes a lot of fear for to get there, but at least she gets there, right? She's not, like, like Makalov and even someone like Kieran, they kind of wallow in mediocrity. Astrid has a has a funny zero to hero arc, so she's better units feel in that range. That said, her bases and her growth are so and her start especially are so bad that I usually don't even deploy her for two dash three because I'm afraid she'll die to these tier one enemies and she doesn't counterattack. Yeah. <laughs> like she can't even counterattack if she wants to. So I usually just undeploy her there. And if I'm not raising Astrid for long term, I'm just never really using her for anything other than chip damage in three nine. So she is very bad, but she's also fun to use if you do want to use a bad unit. So. Highly recommend if you've never trained her, but do temper your expectations stat-wise because, oh boy, 15 strength is not good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's not a lot. I do think, like, j just keep the steel bow and the iron longbow on her. Like, I, I don't really think your inventory actually gets any better than this, <laughs> frankly. Like, steel bow has 35 uses, that's 35 turns of Astrid, basically. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you're actually training her, I do really recommend forging a bow for her, but yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Fair enough, in 3-11 at least, or in 3-11 onwards, yeah, but I, I, I was thinking like just for the CRK exclusive maps. Absolutely, <laughs> the other bows have shitty accuracy. <laughs> yeah, like, what do you, they, they, they either tank your accuracy or they tank your damage, and you kind of need both of them as much as you can with Astrid. So, I do want to ask a quick question, can you go to her weapon ranks? Mm-hmm. What, what the hell's that? Why does she have XP? I don't know, I think that's I just know. how she joins. Is this how I was like, did you did you hack the ROM or something? Or, I have I no mean, idea what it is. Did you scratch your CD, right? No. I don't know. Maybe it's transfers. I'm trying to think. Oh, maybe. Did we use did her we radiant dawn? Astrid? Did we use her? No. Don't you get like transfers anyway from Path of Radiance? If even if you're not like at max level, do you get like weapon rank transfers? Maybe that's it. Do you? I've. No I think her idea. normal base bows is just A with nothing here. For the yeah. Record. Which is just. Which is like, I mean, I'm not going to complain about having a bows, but it's a strange amount to have on a level two unit, you know, right? So. <laughs> I know, right? So, I don't know. I, we didn't, we did train her a lot until benching her in Path of Radiance. So that's why I think it came from. Like, we gave her like a lot of levels, although not a whole maybe, lot of bow yeah. XP. Come to think of it, that's curious. A, I do want to where it comes lot, from. Yeah. I have no idea. Maybe this, maybe honestly, it's simple. Maybe it's just how much she starts with. Uh huh. <laughs> Might be. Maybe she always has this much. We'll find out. Comment section probably pays very close attention to the end of this video. That's true. <laughs> because uh, is there anything left on Astrid that you'd like to say? Uh, no, to be honest, an eight Paragon's kind of cool. That mm -hmm. like helps with the zero to hero arc. But I mean, if if you take the Paragon off of Astrid for your Grail Mercs, I wouldn't blame you. No, it's either you you're using her long term and you used an eight Paragon, or you don't use Astrid long term and you probably you might still keep it on her because you know, uh, like you're probably only favoring one unit. In a in the Crimean Royal Knights, right? And it'll probably be if it's not Astrid, then it's probably Marcia or Khalil or Danvet. So you give them Paragon. Then the other one is like uh I put it on Joffrey so he maybe gets some helpful level ups. No, you don't want to do that. You give it to Kieran no. so that he gets some like a more helpful level up in the mid chapter or something. Like that's probably yeah, Khalil it. maybe, I don't know. Yeah, yeah something like that. Marcia. There's so few. You don't really care. I think I think I'm gonna take Paragon off of her because I don't want it to die with her. But I still want to deploy her. That's my logic gonna be for three nine, I think. Yeah, no, that's wise. That is what I think. So, yeah. That's the whole squad. Um, all of them uh, discussed in a mm -hmm. very record time. I think one and a half hours what we got. Might still be about as much as the Dom Brigade for just the first half. So, yay to us. We were very brief on this one, comparatively yeah. speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, Raisins, thanks for joining me for this uh, unit discussion. And uh, we'll be back later with, I think... We can squeeze in maybe one or two part three maps before Engage comes out, but it'll depend on the exact timing. So I will keep you all updated on that. Uh, but we might not That's get right, very yeah. far because as of recording, it's it's January the 3rd right now. The game is less than three weeks away. I usually have two or three episodes per week. And right now the uploads are up to 2-2 is coming out tonight. So we're cutting it close. 
but I think we can squeeze yeah. in some part three before I engage. Maybe. We should be able to do that. Yeah. I will let you all know, but until then, we will see you next time. See you next time. Oh, we forgot Lisa Mordecai. Oh, we sure did. <laughs> um, I, I'll squeeze it in. Hold up. I'll grab it. Oh, we, we just forget all the Lakus. Maybe that's going to just be the joke. <laughs> that would be the joke. We forget the Lakus. Forget all the Lakus. <laughs> How did we skip them? I guess it was the unit order that we did. They, yeah, they're at the top.